Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss about modern monetary theory. This will be, will be a complete guide to the modern monetary theory wherein we shall explain what is modern monetary theory and how does modern monetary theory actually works. Now the core idea behind the modern monetary theory or MMT is that the government and the current monetary setup with, with its sovereign and fiat money should expand its fiscal deficit and print it over. This is in order to achieve its objective of full employment. Government spending in this way would not crowd out private investment and impact future supply. In any case, according to MMT, the true crowding out in modern monetary setup is increasingly becoming a limited concept. Taxes in today's context for the government are not really a revenue collection tool, but rather a demand control and an inflation control method. The limits posed on MMT are coming from, will come from inflation and international competition. Four particular points that would be that we would be talking in particular in this presentation are role of taxes under modern monetary theory, the inflation limit that the modern monetary theory talks about and is very critical, as well as the international competition for supply of goods and services. And finally, the crowding out phenomenon. Some points to be noted though are that modern monetary theory or MMT is a theoretical framework which gives the most accurate picture of the current monetary setup of the world. That's what this theory, this theory does. And emanating out of this are some of the policy changes or recommendations for the governments specifically regarding fiscal deficit, role of taxes, crowding out phenomenon, and international dimension related to supply. Or if I summarize it, more or less funding and spending mechanism of the fiscal deficit, which ultimately clears some wrong notions that are still prevalent due to the vestige of the old monetary system. And unfortunately, many of the governments are still pursuing with them. The aim of MMT, like any most of the economic theories, is the same, to achieve optimum economic growth, that is, achieve optimum employment levels or supply levels while at the same time maintaining low inflation. Now, correctly applying the monetary frameworks affect the demand and supply in the economy in the short to medium term. There are other areas of economy, particularly regarding the long term growth like the elements of productivity, which are critical. And as I said before, MMT is a theoretical framework to see the monetary setup. And application of MMT in these areas can affect long, long, longer term productivity, which can be detrimental to economy. So with that said, let's delve into the world of MMT, starting with understanding the monetary setup of the world. Briefly touch upon the various monetary setups earlier. Since the onset of civilization and the introduction of the concept of money, we have been more or less on some kind of a commodity based system. The most popular among them was the gold standard of money. Not so long ago, we used to have something called bread and wood system. Under the system, the various currencies of the world were linked to the US dollar and the dollar in turn was linked to the gold. So it was kind of a semi commodity based system or an indirect commodity based system. What were the advantages and disadvantages here? Well, the advantage was that it used to keep a leash on the government spending and the malinvestments in the economy used to quickly correct. This is because the credit extended by the banks used to mean revert 
since ultimately it has to match up with the amount of gold present. The disadvantages were that the economy never realized its true potential. So even if there was demand in the economy for credit, the banks could not ex extend that beyond a point simply because there was not enough gold to, to back it up. Also, the government under this system had to make a choice between spending on A, sector A or sector B, spending on research or poverty elevation since the credit was limited. This system ultimately collapsed in August 1971 and the US president of that then, Richard Nixon, made the announcement. Today, we are in something called the credit-based monetary system. The modern monetary theory emanates out of this credit-based monetary system, also called credit-based money. Now, how does it, this works? How does credit-based money works? Well, let's say a person goes to the bank to get some loan, get some credit. The bank extends the loan to the person in lieu of some collateral. And that's it. Voila! Credit is created and money is created in the economy. Why? Because, as the name suggests, money is credit in this system. And credit is money. So remember, in this system, money is ultimately be created by the bank out of simply thin air. It's a fiat money. Deposits in the system are not needed really to create the, the loan. They are being created out of thin air. They are only needed to balance the books. And instead, it's the opposite. It's really the deposits are being formed because the credit is being created by the banks, not vice versa. For more details, check out the money presentation and the link will be provided in the description. So, we have discussed briefly, we have touched upon briefly on this, that in this system, government has monopoly over the money supply. It can simply print the money. How can it do that? Well, the government can run a fiscal deficit which is the excess of expenditure over the revenue the government receives and can issue debt. This debt can in turn be bought by the central banks or in case of US, the Federal Reserve. And how the Fed will do that? Well, it will print money and using that money, it will buy that debt and that freshly printed money would go into the federal government's account and that's it money has been indirectly printed by the US government. This process in modern day is also being called as QE or quantitative easing. Also remember that the role of taxes in the system where government has monopoly over tax collection but under MMT taxes are not the source of revenue rather they are tool to control demand and thus inflation. So what is the role of money for government and how is it different for us, from, from us in the system? Unlike us, government for government money has no store of value in the system. Why do I say that? Well, think about it. If you have something that is theoretically infinite and potentially you can have it at any time, would that thing would have any value for you? Of course not. So for the government, money has no store of value, but it does have a measurement value, like for us. It measures its wealth, taxes, etc. using money. It's like a scale, like we measure distance in kilometers and miles. Money also for the government has a medium of exchange value wherein it can buy goods and services using money. So now let's talk about one of the most critical aspects of MMT, the real role of taxes. Now as we have seen that government has a monopoly over money. Money has no store of value for government unlike for us. So taxes 
are not really a tool for revenue collection of government, then what exactly is the real role of taxes in the economy? Let's see. Why taxes? First point, it maintains the authority of the government over money supply. So here is what it means. The government has a monopoly over money in the economy. And to maintain that, the government spends money in the economy. The money that is created literally out of thin air. Now why would the people collect that money that is, has been printed out of thin air in the economy? Well, the people do collect that because they have to pay taxes to the government. The government takes taxes and that is a source of monopoly of government over the money supply because it has to collect these taxes. Second point. The taxes controls the demand and hence inflation which is very important for the current monetary setup according to modern monetary theory to succeed. Here is how. Let's say the demand for products is rising in the economy. Now the, there is hard, the, the supply of products is actually pretty low in the economy however. This gives rise to inflation. Hence the government comes in and raises the taxes. This leads to lowering of money supply in the economy and thus reduction in demand which leads to reduction in inflation of the economy. Then, so the negative sides of inflation you can check the presentation, detailed presentation on inflation. The link would again be given in the description. Third point, removing taxes completely would be politically imprudent. Let's say the government reduces the taxes to zero. Of course, the people would be elated, happy. Now, inflation starts to shoot up in the economy and the government has to raise taxes to control it. Now that would make the, make the people furious. And then what about the votes for the government? It will be a tough decision to make. And invariably, the government will mess it up. Fourth point, it's a tool for wealth transfer. So due to taxes, the government takes money from person A and gives it to person B for its welfare programs. So it's a tool for wealth transfer in the economy. And finally, taxes can control production choices in the economy. So here is how it works. Let's say there is a factory producing goods A in the economy. The government in its wisdom feels that these goods should be produced less in the economy. And so it is raises taxes on these goods in the economy. The price rises, the demand for these goods A reduces and the production also comes down in the economy. Similarly, let's say there is there are, there's a factory producing goods B in the economy. Again, the government in its wisdom feels that these goods should be produced more in the economy. And so the government reduces the taxes on these goods B. This means the price reduces, demand rises, and hence the production of goods B rise in the economy. Thus, using taxes, the government can control the matrix, the production matrix in the economy. So the role of money for the government as comes out from MMT is majorly a tool to allocate resources, transfer wealth, and control the levers of supply and demand in the economy. Now following this, we try to answer one of the most critical questions in economic development. 
where should the government spend its money? In satellites or healthcare, high tech research or poverty alleviation? The answer, according to MMT, why can't we do both? Why can't the government spend both on healthcare and high tech research or satellites and poverty alleviation? Now some may ask, where is the money? Well, haven't we seen that government has monopoly over money? It can increase its deficit and print more money. So again, why can't we do both? This, where is the money question, is a mindset of commodity-based monetary system and not really the modern credit-based monetary set up. So some people may ask, what about inflation? Well, I agree, inflation is the limit that can impose on this modern monetary theory. But I would ask, when does inflation actually occur? Inflation occurs only if we hit limit boundaries on the factors of production or the slack on those factors for production goes away. So let me explain. In this case, one, let's say there are 100 people making a road while only 50 are needed. This disguise unemployment is what we call it. There's a built commercial building nearby and the contractor of that building is working to install some statues. Now to be fair, that work the contractor is doing may be aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. However, it has very low economic value. However small the economic value is, the contractor approaches the, the road contractor and asks for 10 people. The road contractor is happy to give him 10 people. Because of that, road work is not affected at all. It is as in any case only 50 people were required and the work in the building is also completed. Now, however small that economic value is, in terms of some total, the economy is better off because of this. Let's take another case. There are 100 people, but this time, all the 100 people required to make the road. And following the same schedule, the building contractor approaches the road contractor for 10 people. This time, the road contract refuses. So, in, in lieu of that, the building contractor says that he is ready to pay a higher wages to the laborers. Let's say 1.5 times. So, the overall price of the labor goes up because of it. And as a result of this, since some people have gone and worked on the building work, contract with the with the building contractor the road work is affected and since the load has been delayed the future productivity of the economy also declines inflation as we have seen has gone higher and this is where inflation is hitting the economy because we have hit those boundary limits or we have we don't have slack to do this project. So you say, okay, let's say we can do both, but why, why doesn't the government do both in most of the cases? Well, the two states here, for rich countries, many a times the slack that is required, in, especially in labor, is not available. Also, the productivity of the labor is not increasing anymore to increase the slack since the population is aging. Also, already the labor is at a high productivity plane compared to the developing countries. For poor countries, you may ask, then why do the poor countries could have a lot of slack in labor? Why doesn't the government spend money on healthcare and poverty elevation and remove it since it has monopoly over money and potentially infinite source supply of money? While agreeing with you that the government should not fuss too much about fiscal deficit and increase it. But 
it should be careful in spending and take smaller steps. Let's take an example. Let's say the government doubles its health outlay immediately. What will happen? You know, a technical, a technological marvel, it's a software that can improve the productivity of the economy can be made in one or two years. A mega expressway can be constructed in three to four years. However, a doctor would take 30 years to make. Human capital takes a long time to develop simply because of its biological nature. It's not an overnight job and no amount of money can help beyond a point. So if we increase the health outlay, if we double the health outlay, immediately the limit boundaries would be hit since there's very little slack in that sector. And so the healthcare costs will zoom across the country, across the economy, and this will hit the poor and middle class badly, which is quite opposite of what the government intending to, intended to do. Let's take another example. Suppose the same thing the government does with poverty elevation. What happens then? Well, the inflation would zoom because there wouldn't be supply. You say, okay, maybe the supply can come in one or two years or three years. But some supply would definitely come in in three, four years. However, however, it would not be complete. Reason? Again, the bottleneck of human capital. Creating supply requires, especially away from the basic product, require skilled and knowledgeable workers. And that, to build those, will take time. And hence, this will increase the overall inflation of the economy. And we have discussed this issue in greater detail in the inflation presentation. Do check that out in the, and the link is given in the description. But just briefly, I will tell you that an overall inflation in the economy leads to only one thing, and that is wealth transfer from poor and middle class to asset owners who are generally rich. So, in a sense, the government should increase its fiscal deficit, but should be careful and take smaller steps to avoid hitting the limit boundaries on factors of production. Doing so can be beneficial to the population of the country at large. And hence, if the, especially if the inflation is low, the government should not fuss too much about fiscal deficit. Having said that, one important dimension that I must introduce and that the government should keep in mind while designing its fiscal deficit program is the supply status of the country. That is, the increases fiscal deficit, the government must ensure that it will cause growth in the domestic country and its supply is capable to meet the increase, the potential increase in demand. Because in an open economy, it can so happen that increase in demand, instead of increasing your domestic supply, can increase the supply of any other country. And hence, the, instead of increasing your growth, instead increases the growth of the other country from where you start importing goods. Now, why do I say that? Let's take a scenario. Here, the government increases its fiscal deficit, that is, take in more debt. This debt is funded by the central bank through money printing, essentially. And so the level of money in the economy rises. That means the demand in the economy increases. Now, if this demand can be catered to by the increase in domestic supply, then the inflation, overall inflation of the economy would be stable and the economy will see a growth. However, if the domestic supply cannot cater to this demand, then there can be two scenarios. One, domestic inflation in the economy rises, which is not what we need. Or there can be a second scenario in an open economy wherein the imports in the economy rises. 
And that would mean that instead of increase in domestic supply and domestic growth, the growth is largely increased in some other country that is selling the goods to your country. And that is a scenario which has to be kept in mind while increasing the fiscal deficit apart from the inflation risks. Now, let's briefly talk about crowding out phenomena. Crowding out essentially occurs when the government tries to fund its fiscal deficit without increasing money supply in the economy. Thus, taking a larger share of existing money pool and leaving less for the private sector, wherein the interest rates would rise for the private sector and there is a risk of fall in investments. However, in the era of sovereign fiat currency, the crowding out, the absolute crowding out is no longer a phenomenon. Now, why do I say that? Because the central bank sets a short-term target interest rate and it aggressively defends this short-term target interest rate through open market operations. Now, if the government's fiscal deficit without being accompanied by money printing puts pressure on liquidity and hence short-term interest rates, the central bank intervenes, conducts what is called open market operations, wherein it buys the short-term debt with freshly printed money. And hence, and hence, it's essentially money printing happening. Sure, the impact, since it's buying short-term debt, the impact of this would be smaller. And it will have, so it will have a limited impact on the longer duration debt. And so, even though an absolute crowding out doesn't happen, the impact on the longer dated interest rates is limited by the central bank, bank actions on the shorter end. And hence, the area where the real lending and borrowing happens, that is the longer dated securities, it puts ultimately a pressure on the interest rates. However, again, increasingly, post-2008, we are witnessing that even small pressures in the financial markets forces the hands of central bank these days to go beyond their earlier mandate. Now, crowding out, a true crowding out, doesn't really impact demand too much. However, since the interest rates for the private sector increases, it affects the in their investment and hence the future supply of the economy that may lead to a worse economic outcome. So I would say that only in some rare situations where the government wants to control some skewed economic demand or cause in its wisdom some kind of a wealth transfer, specific wealth transfer, is when it should opt for crowding out to fund its fiscal deficit. So let's summarize now. We are not in the old commodity commodity based monetary system. Under the new credit based monetary system, both high end research and social spending can happen. So both can happen till the boundary limits or in other words, inflation is not hit as far as the factors of production are concerned. Also, the supply of the country has to be able to cater to the increased demand without much recourse to increase in imports. Taxation is a tool for demand control and not really revenue collection. And so, the government should not fuss too much over fiscal deficit. Having said that, it should take care of the above two points related to inflation and import demand in order to achieve optimum economic output. And finally, MMT works on the monetary side, but care has to be taken on the real side 
with relation to economic productivity. Final point, which is not really related to MMT, but important. As you have seen in the few, last few slides, the real development indicator of a country is really the human development rather than the physical infrastructure development. Why? Because it takes time to develop. And once developed, even if the physical infrastructure goes away for some reason, let's say natural calamity, the human, if the human capital is developed, it can recreate that physical infrastructure. So, when you look at the country and its development, don't look at the cars that the country is running. Don't look at the number of television sets that the country has. Look at how much innovations the country has done, how many great engineers, scientists and doctors it has per capita. That's the real mark of development. So thank you very much for watching this presentation. I hope you like it. If you did, please do subscribe to this channel if you are interested in such content. Do like and comment if you have any queries. Thank you very much.